claim the proper use of a regular terminology, much less uh, the philatelic terminology. And then in our particular area, where, where we're dealing with words that can literally have a, a significant amount of effect on the value of item, using that terminology becomes more and more important all the time, and using it consistently. And so it uh, started out just kind of a venting at some of my some of my worst uh, bits of terminology here and then has been expanding greatly in the last couple of months now I'm getting phone calls and emails and people stopping me saying you gotta talk about this one, you gotta talk about this one. So there, obviously there's a lot of frustration out there in the hobby about the use or improper use of terminology. So I'm gonna cover a few of the of the major ones today and of course you'll see most of these in the uh, <coughs> Probably my most, my biggest pet peeve is auction catalogs, dealers, collectors, uh, everyone who, who call set off offset. And, and it's, a, it's extremely commonly used. Now, offset, of course, as you might teach stamp technology, offset is a very specific form of printing. It's an indirect form of printing. What you see on the backs of stamps, Maybe somewhat of an offset design, but it's not an <coughs> offset. The, the technical term in George Brett was very, I don't think he ever used it once wrong in his life, is actually set off. Now, what, what you're seeing here, this is the difference between flat plate and rotary press. Flat plate stamps when they're printed, they're printed in sheets and come off the press and they're stacked. And usually, before the sheets are not quite dry, they'll pick up a little bit of income on the gum side of the stamp and then deposit it. You won't find that on rotary press. So a minor set off like this is actually determined between flat plate and rotary press. My favorite ones, though, are, are the major mirror set offs. And this does not come from stacking sheets together. What happens, and this happens only again on, on flat plate uh, printings, is the uh, when you've got a sheet traveling through, you've got the uh, inked plate up here ready to ink the paper. If the paper does not travel through the press at the intended time, it comes down and contacts the, the platen beneath where the paper should be and, and leaves the ink there. So when the next sheet of paper comes through, boom, comes down, presses it, and picks it up. And again, this is a major mirror offset. Set off. Set off. Set off. Set off. <laughs> I mean, coffee. Coffee. <laughs> Same thing with a partial mirror set off. Uh, in this case, this, this one is, is neat diagnostically uh, because you can see where two sheets were traveling through the press at one time. Uh, and what happened is the first, the first one went actually didn't go through the press, took it down on the platen. And then what should have been the intended sheet, the, the, the Indians you see on the top part, should have appeared on the front side of that sheet, and they do, but it's a different, different impression. But what happened? got delayed on the press, somebody bumped it, whatever. Two sheets traveled through at the same time, so the sheet that was traveling through with it and not quite aligned with it took the rest of the impression. Of course, we'll never know what happened to it. Uh, mirror set-offs also, they happen on virtually all flat plate issues. This is uh, one that's not a used example, and because it's on the paper before the stamps are done, it's underneath. So this, this is a used example. The gun's been so proud, you can see it's still very much there. Uh, and typically when this happens, it'll keep going until the ink is completely gone from the platen. So the first couple of impressions will be very strong mirror set-offs. And then from there, it slowly fades out until it's slowly gone, eventually gone. This, however, is an undesirable set-off. And uh, you may know what happened in this case. Stuck together. Yeah, that's it. Somebody, somebody stored their stamps in, in too humid of an area, and uh, they got stuck together. Now, sometimes I see these offered as mirror setoffs, and, and there's a really easy way to tell the difference. On, on mirror setoffs, particularly mint ones, the gum is totally undisturbed. On these, not so much. <laughs> Pre-printing paper creases. This is the other big bugaboo of mine. Again, you, you see collectors, dealers, auction houses, they, they all offend. They call them folds. What about this as a fold? What happens is before the paper goes through the press, 
it forms an internal crease. And in the creases like you would find on fabric or anything else. And it'll go through the printing process and it'll open up sometimes after it's printed, sometimes after it's canceled anywhere along the line. Whereas the fold is just simply there, it's a fold over. Now in this case, this is this is one of my favorite ones. As you know, I kind of like EFOs. Uh, because this one was a pre-printing crease that opened up between colors. So it was closed when it went through the uh, uh, it was closed when it went through the brown printing. And then opened up before the green, or actually after the green, but before the gray was printed. So you've got the crease, which is a big void going through both the brown and the green, but if, and if you can see it well enough, the gray uh, it is okay there. What that also did then is it created a much more of a color shift than you normally would have found on this. This is a fold over. This is a major fold over. And, and as opposed to a crease, which you know, I've got paper coming through. You can sometimes find this on envelopes, covers that have gone through too. They've gotten creased before they go through the canceler. And so they go through the cancel cancellation machine like this and it opens up and you may have the dial over here and the, and the bars over here. A fold over, on the other hand, is, uh, is it's a fold over. And in this case, this folded over several times uh, after perforating. It's printed perfectly normally, but before it was processed into a booklet. So once you open out that fold, you have, it's not quite, but you have a very, very nearly complete imperfect between pair, um, which is a really nice thing for people like that. Sulfurization. And this this is one that is is more tolerated because again because of its widespread use, but it really is uh, inaccurate to call an orange stamp that's turned brown oxidized. That's not what happened at all. The uh, most inks, particularly yellows and oranges and things like this, have have a metallic uh, factor to them. Many of them actually contain some lead. And the sulfur that's contained in high acid wood pulp paper, uh, heavily polluted areas and such, actually begins to sulfurize and darken the metal content in these inks. If you want to return it to its normal color, you actually have to oxidize it. So oxidizing it is what actually returns it to its normal color. The easiest way to do this with these, again, orange stamps turned brown, is just go down to your local drugstore and pick up a cheap bottle of hydrogen peroxide, a 59 cent bottle. Do it only for used stamps because mint stamps are going to wash the gum off if you do this. And soak it for a couple of minutes in that. Uh, there have been a couple of people who've criticized me over the years for, for openly doing this to say this is, this is, you know, messing with stamps, this is altering stamps, but it's not. What you're actually doing is you're, you're uh, undoing a progressive form of damage and actually conserving your stamps by doing this. So if you have these, I mean, some of them look pretty cool, but it is damaging the stamp over time and will, will continue to get worse. Uh, and again, the cause, most of the cause in this is, you'll find, if, you, if you've if you ever looked at an old Cat and Tim stamp album or some of the old stamp albums from the 30s and 40s where it's on very high acid wood pulp paper, most of the orange stamps are turned brown. And again, it's the, uh, it's all the sulfur, that's kind of the sulfites that are contained in the high acid paper to do this. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with restoring your stamps with hydrogen peroxide. It's a very simple thing. If you've got unused stamps, talk to me. There's, a, there's ways to do it. You can fume them, but it's, it's a very tricky process and you risk damaging your stamps doing that. Letterpress. Letterpress is a very specific term that's been around nearly as long as the printing type's been here. It's, it's a literal word. You're literally pressing the letters up against the paper. It's a, it's a relief form of printing where the, the high areas, as you can see in the plate here, is what takes the ink and deposits it on the, on the paper. What stamp catalogs, many of them, uh, and many of us do is we call letterpress typography. It's not, that, that ceased to be a term to describe this printing process some 50 or 60 years ago. Typography universally stands for the study of type fonts now. We'll put together letters and study type fonts and stuff. So if you, if you say a stamp is typographed, that's, that's now, it's now become an inappropriate term. It was acceptable at the turn of the last century, 
but it's, it is now completely outdated, and it's important to save the letterpress. Of course, that, again, relief printing for letterpress includes everything from typewriters to rubber stamps, cancellation devices, any, any relief form of, of printing. Uh, most uh, surcharges and overprints are also a form of letterpress. Postcard versus postal card. I hear lots of chuckling on this one. <laughs> a postcard is that yeah, a pretty little thing that gets sent through the mail. There's uh, some really nice ones and very scarce ones, but you lick and stick and put a stamp on the back of it to send it. A postal card is a government produced item with the postage already imprinted. Now you do have picture postal cards, and that's really where some governments, including the United States, have done a few of them have produced essentially a picture postcard on one side with the imprinted stamp on the other side. So if you refer to a postal card, you're talking about the government issue thing with the postage already applied. Whereas a postcard, you might have a bunch of sheep in Espanola in Mexico. By the way, if you have any questions or anything along the way, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. That's always it. Fluorescence and phosphorescence. Uh, again, unless you're a specialist, this is an easy one to, to skip over. The, the overall big term for anything that glows is luminescence. Now underneath, beneath that, you have phosphorescence and fluorescence. And the difference between those is the wavelength at which they, uh, at which they get excited, is the, is the whole term here. Uh, long wave ultraviolet light is what, you, is what you would view fluorescence with. And these are this, the types of lights that you see at roller skating rinks and things like this, the purple lights that with brighteners make things bright like violet or otherwise. Phosphorescence, on the other hand. Wayne, did you go back to the previous one? Was that produced by uh, General Mills, the fluorescence? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, someone's had too much coffee this <laughs> Good catch, too. Uh, Phosphorescence, on the other hand, is, is much lower on the wavelength scale and much closer to the infrared uh, area. And, and only the, the, the tagging on the United States stands, the phosphorescent tagging, can only be seen in the short wave ultraviolet light. And uh, mostly the, the compounds on those, by the way, are, are made up from various forms of ground up rocks. Uh, the uh, yellow green that you see here is uh, zinc orthosilicate, and the orange red that you see on the aerials is calcium silicate. The, 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 again, the two are very different. You have luminescence over the top of fluorescence, which is everything long wave. And you can see fluorescence under short wave as well, and then phosphorescence, which is uh, very much under short wave. And centering. How many times have you seen jumbo on three sides? <laughs> or extra fine, mostly. Or, you know, things like that. <laughs> you know, if we're talking about a truly very fine or XF stamp, it really does need to be that. You know, the, the stamp on the left is, is, although it's got some perf issues, the centering itself is close to an XF. Uh, the stamp in the middle, sure, it's a jumbo, and I guess you could say it's jumbo on three sides. But in terms of the actual centering, it's, it's really rather poor, uh, as is the one on the right. The one on the right, and, and you know, great reading for this is either the beginning of the stock catalog or if you can get a hold of a uh, St. Mark Porter, the SMQ put out by PSE, they show all the grading scales and, and how, uh, what, what constitutes a VF and what constitutes an XF or an average stamp. And it's a, it's a great thing to study. Um, and it varies for some stamps. I mean, there are some stamps that, that are, to use a way overused term, notoriously uh, poorly centered. So you, so you will see in, in auction catalogs, very fine for this stamp. And that's sometimes true and sometimes not. But. Perforation issues. Uh, you know, again, I see these things used interchangeably, but there, there's a number of different terms that you can use. But on the upper left stamp, lumped or nibbed purse, they're just kind of worn out looking or, or a little bit shorter than the others. There's nothing really wrong with them other than they're just not very pleasant looking. Uh, short purse, on the other hand, like on the green credo issue, there's a few purse, if you look along the side, there's a few purse that are actually shorter than the others. 
Now, in some cases, there's an optical illusion that's formed when you have abnormally perforation teeth along one side, except for two or three perfs that look that are normal. And in that case, those aren't short perfs. It's, it's, they're shorter than the others, but if you were to alter the stamp and remove some of that, then you'd actually have a much nicer stamp. But the worst type of perf fault you can possibly have is a pull perf. And what happens there, it's not just a short perf, and I see pull perfs described as short perfs all the time. A pull perforation is where you're actually, you've actually pulled into the paper fibers of the stamp so that in the valley of the, or the, what would have been the tooth of the perforation, you actually pulled into the stamp area. And that's, that's uh, kind of a death sentence for, for a stamp in some ways. Kiss print. And this has become more, more of a controversial term. But a kiss print is not a double impression. And in this case, you can't see it very well on this, but up in the top, up in, up in the area of postage and such, you see what appears to be some doubling. And all kiss print refers to is the lightest possible impression you can get on a stamp. And sometimes that's done by just simply bumping it against the plate before it's printed. Uh, a jitter on the press, there's any number of different causes for it, but it's not true doubling. A true double printing is where either a, a portion or the entire uh, stamp image has been placed under pressure against the plate. And it's a little bit, a little bit different. And this is that actually a kiss print is a form of a facial set off, but uh, for whatever reason we don't call it that. EFOs, errors, freaks, and oddities. Uh, again, these are these many people misuse these terms because they don't fully understand them. But to be a true error, a stamp has to be completely missing a step, or it has to be completely and consistently uh, screwed up. Uh, a color has to be entirely missing, not a single dot or two of it here or there. Perforations have to be completely omitted. Uh, the image has to be completely inverted. Uh, or any number of other things that make up a major error. And not all major errors are rare. There's a lot of very common imperfect oils and things like this that are very cheap. Freaks are by far the largest category of this. And that includes everything from color shifts to almost color missings, all about blind perforations, uh, uh, color shifts, uh, uh, any, anything that falls into that major visual appearance uh, but not necessarily completely missing a step. And in many cases, these are just as costly as many major errors, but they're not consistent. They may have happened on one sheet, they may have happened on five sheets. Uh, in some cases, the perforation shifts where you get the perforations on a bias. You've got a sheet of 50 stamps, you've got 50 different misperfed freaks on it. So it's, it's not a consistent thing. These the freaks, by the way, are never listed by catalogs for that very reason. They're not a consistent production uh, error. So there's, there's nothing to do about that. Oddities, you know, that's kind of our catch-all term. If it's not a freak and it's not an error, it's an oddity. And this can be anything from plate varieties to um, tiny ink smears that you don't really want to call a freak to whatever doesn't fit a category. Even, even Cinderella's and things like that are often called oddities. Wait. Yeah, so that... <clears throat> Going back to the slide on flower essence, was that an error, a freak, or an oddity? It was, uh, it was probably an error caused by a freak. Thank you, Gary. Again, another another really misunderstood area is the whole area of fake forgeries and counterfeits. And as, as a hobby, we tended to use these terms interchangeably throughout, pretty much throughout the history of the hobby. Um, and this is one that actually, I guess as much of anything I've tried to impose on the hobby for consistency's sake, they're not necessarily right or wrong. But fakes, in my mind, anything that's fake is generally a real stamp that's had perforations added, that's been regummed. Somehow it's been altered in some way. That's, that's faking something on the stamp. Forgeries are out now fabrications. These can be packet forgeries of the 1800s where the stamp dealer didn't have enough to be made up his own. Uh, they can be forgeries that are manufactured to fleece collectors, uh, anything like that. But counterfeits, on the other hand, are a totally different critter. And, and those are postal counterfeits. These are fabrications of stamps that are meant to defraud whatever postal service, whether it's United States Postal Service or any other governmental agency. And so 
if we use these terms consistently, the shorthand, we can know exactly what they are by, by using them properly. So again, fakes are altered stamps, forgeries are fabricated items to fool collectors, whether it's to, to fulfill demand or to lighten somebody's pocketbook. And counterfeits are actually meant to be fraud uh, governmental agencies. And those are, by the way, highly desirable. Scott's just started listing them, so there are some of many of them very bad. Yeah, Pete. You know, I suggest, Wayne, that I, from time to time, it wins. Just to put the uh, definitions in there. In other words, if they appear enough, enough times, people will get used to uh, seeing them in the right context. Well, it, exactly. And, 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 as, as an editor, uh, if, if writers don't do it, I sometimes impose it on them. Because as an editor, I get to play God with words. But um, if, I, I always advise people when they write never to assume a frame of reference. And if you're going to write about face forgeries and counterfeits, do a brief explanation to begin with. Do exactly what you're talking about. Let people know what it is. It helps educate them as well as they know where you're coming from. But in, in a broader sense, never assume a frame of reference. It's always best to use a few words to, to actually clear up what you're talking about before you begin talking about it. So I'm glad, I'm glad you continue to suggest that. And the, most any self-respecting editor, you know, our job is to help you sound better. You know what you're talking about. We want to make sure everybody else does too. And, and again, that leads right back into the whole use of terminology. Proper use, you know, shouldn't be an onerous or intimidating thing. It's something that should come naturally to us over time because we use them consistently. If we use them inconsistently, we're never going to understand them. We're not going to use them properly. Uh, but knowing the reasons why and how these terms are developed is most of the battle. And if, you know, what I've, what I've shown you today and what I've done in the magazine the last couple of months is really kind of just hitting the, the tip of the iceberg. These are some of the worst offenders in my opinion, but we have dozens and dozens of terms and probably if we go around the room, you probably have some pet peeves of your own that, that, that we can talk about. Um, anyway, basically that's it. Any, uh, yeah? Wait, well, how is it? Uh, does the postal service today have any quality control at all? about so much of junk getting out, don't they take any pride in themselves? Well, so actually, well, now when you say junk getting out, you're not talking about EFO material. Uh, right. I guess freaks, you know, that they get out actually, of the <coughs> Actually, as, as a collector of that material, there's less of it coming out now than there ever has. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm finding almost no new EFO material. Really? Uh, they, they do have quality control, they do work very hard at it. One of the things that's happened, and again, we cover this in the class, and most of you have taken my class, so you've you heard some of the spiel before. But as, as technology has changed over the years, and we get uh, a lot of much more highly mechanized printing and processing, uh, there's a lot fewer human eyes on the process as it goes through. So we're normally people would catch things along the line if it's all mechanized. This is why coils in particular, you're seeing so many imperfs for a while, because they get printed, all the quality control was there, they had the people watching the print being printed, they'd run a roll-to-roll -roll examination, they did all of that stuff, but then they put it on the coiling machines, and the coiling machines were completely automated, and nobody saw what was happening. So at one end, you've got a big web of, of printed stamps going through, and at the other end, you've got a bunch of little blister packs of 100 stamp coils, and nobody saw what was happening and so if you had equipment malfunctions, you could have misslit stamps, you could have converters and things like this that nobody would anything about. And they try to, to tweak these systems and make them better. Uh, and, but now, for whatever reason, and I don't think it's that quality control is that much better. For one thing, we're producing far fewer stamps than we used to. If you were to look at the print totals for the United States over the past 25, 30 years, uh, it is steeply, steeply declined. Uh, so that's one reason we're not seeing as much as I don't know what it is exactly, and I'm going to maybe hang my hat a little bit on an assumption, but it seems like the self adhesive technology lends itself to fewer freaks and oddities than the standard uh, that we have for it. Just a follow up question. A good friend of mine who owns a big printing company in Brooklyn, and he's a stamp collector, and he bought like a hundred of those sheets, <laughs> hoping, <laughs> told me you have to buy thousands, tens of thousands, have any chance. But he said, you know, keep just looking through them. He's a very careful person. He said, no, how poorly they're printed. Can't be in some way 
the French continued to help produce beautiful stones in other countries. That I was there so shoddy, he said I couldn't even find a perfectly centered one. <laughs> 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 for hours. <coughs> well, and, and, and that is an issue, but the, you know, the fact of the matter, I, the other one I hear is, is the Swedish produce such great stamps, too. But both the French and the Swedish are putting out a fraction of the number of stamps that we are. And so they can lavish a little bit more time and attention on them. But, but the issues that we do have with some of our stamps are very real. This, in, in the case of the, of the non invert uh, it, it was intended to be a philatelic issue. So therefore, rather than running at breakneck speed, which they tried to do to get these jobs out, it would have behooved them to spend a little more time. Yes, they could have done a much better job on it. The whole idea, uh, does anybody not know what the old concept of philatelic stock was? Yeah. Okay. Back, back, in, back in the old days, um, way back when, when there, was a, when there really was a proactive philatelic division, once the Bureau was done printing a stamp issue, anything they sent to the philatelic sales division, and they actually had people sitting down and examining sheets of stamps and coils of stamps and booklets and stuff, and finding what they call the select stock. These are the best centered, the best colored, uh, the nicest looking stamps, and that's what was sent to the philatelic sales division. So when we ordered from, it was Washington at the time, we ordered from the sales division in Washington, you were generally assured of getting the best stamp, far better stamps than you could possibly find at your local post office. Well, that concept is totally gone now. And, and not only that, in the case of the philatelically inspired issues like the, the non-invert, you know, there, there wasn't even a lot of care taken to ensure that there was consistent press quality along the way. And so that while we don't, there's not a lot of printing freaks on that, like I say, the centering is a problem. Uh, and that's something that could have easily been uh, watched. It's a good observation. Yeah. Um, about your role as an editor, uh, you, you made the observation. Um, what did you, do? you know what you're talking about. I'm not sure that anybody else does. How big a problem is that in philatelic writing? Most flowers pretty good authors, lousy ones. Well, and I hope I don't step on any toes here either. It, it varies depending on the specialty. Uh, you have some areas in the hobby where, like the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society, for example, most of the people who are writing for their journal are also, if they're not interesting writers, they're good writers. In other words, the material that they're, that they're presenting is usually pretty solid because they're used to research and they're used to doing a lot of work with, with the, uh, working with words. Um, so those manuscripts would tend to be a little bit cleaner than, than others. Uh, the manuscripts that come into particularly uh, smaller journals and you know, even newsletters and stuff, you've got people who maybe have a good idea, but they're not used to writing at all. And, and the, the things that, that, that we battle, and one of the things that I battle on topic of time, for example, topic of time is, uh, is anybody not familiar with topic of time? OK, good. Uh, so, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> That's the Journal of the American Topical Association. And the people that write for that, for one thing, you've got to keep your journal's mission clear. And, and for many, many years in topical time, because people collected St. Francis of Assisi on stamps or pickles on stamps or whatever, uh, that eventually degraded it into a thing where people were simply writing the story. I call it wicked telling, right? And so they'd be great in the, where people tell the story of pickles and then they'd illustrate it with a few stamps. Mm -hmm. Well, you, know, you need to write about your subject matter. You've got to include the you know, film material right in it. Uh, but a lot of, there are a lot of us in the hobby who uh, aren't necessarily familiar with writing regularly. And so good editors need to tweak that and you know, bring that along. So the other thing that I do, if I were, if I were editing, sorry. If I were editing a scholarly journal, a much more scholarly journal, I'd have peer review going, and I'd also have review by the, the author periodically. But in philatelic feature writing, one of the things I've always done is that I never send an edited piece to an author to look at, because we're going to get into a war back and forth on a number of things. The fact of the matter is I have to deal with consistency issues, 
uh, language use, style, and everything else in a publication, um, you don't get that opportunity, sorry, you'll see it in print. Uh, but if I was doing a very scholarly journal where everything's footnoted and researched and everything, you need to have both peer review to make sure that the information's correct, and you also need to have uh, the off table look at it, make sure that I actually haven't changed the meaning of what's there as well. Because, you know, a good editor, again, will never change the meaning of the writer's uh, intention, intention, but uh, but we'll tweak it, we'll make it more interesting reading, and we'll also help bring out the ideas that are that are expressed much more clearly. So. I think on the subject of the quality of writing, one key point is the hobby invites people to participate. And so if you happen to discover an inverted stamp or something, it's great if you can write about it. And as a result, there are a lot of people that may have things to say that are not professional writers. So it doesn't bother me if there are people who are not skilled writers who are coming in. I think it's great that we invite in more people to communicate. And that's the role that the editor has, is to help a person who's writing their first article to have a coherent article. Um, the other thing is, I think personally, the biggest challenge that we face right now is with acronyms. Um, if you've ever subscribed to the journal of the specialty society that you have not been a member of since it was founded, you'll discover if you open up a random issue of the journal when you first subscribe, it's often unintelligible because there are so many acronyms. My personal opinion is that there ought to be a key, of, a glossary of acronyms in every issue of every journal that uses acronyms. And if you can't put it in every article because they're repeated throughout the journal, it ought to be at the back. But I think we have to recognize that people go to the library to pick up something or subscribe, and they don't necessarily start from the first issue. I, I think that's a really big problem. Yeah, I, I thank you very much for bringing that. Acronyms are, are a huge problem throughout the hobby. And for some people, people, some people use them for shorthand, some people use them because it sounds more pretentious or, or whatever. Uh, acronyms are a good thing to have, but only people know what they are. And one of the things that I've always done in all my journals uh, that I've edited over the years, or all the magazines I've edited, is if somebody uses an acronym, I make sure the first time it appears in print in that article, it's totally spelled out. I'll then use the acronym afterwards. I like the idea of using a glossary for the most part. But if you, if you spell out that acronym to begin with, Generally, people will pick up on what that is afterwards. But you know, as as a as a teenage collector and trying to read at the time the American Philatelist and many other journals, it took me many many years to figure out who the hell Bob was. <laughs> <laughs> because there are dealers who specialize in Bob. Who's Bob? In fact, of the book, in case they didn't figure out who Bob was. Since since the acronym itself is an acronym, you should explain what it stands for. <laughs> a contrived reduction of nomenclature yielding from arms. <laughs> Very well said. And, 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 and acronyms can either be a bunch of letters or it can be a, a cutesy word made up of these letters. Uh, pardon me. Uh, here. Along this subject, along with getting on your topic, uh, one of the editorial weaknesses that drives me nuts uh, in the area of postal history is authors who use city and town names in, and they're totally obscure, in countries that I don't know what the country is. And you know, the author assumes that, that you know where, you know, some Oshkosh, well, Oshkosh is the to figure out, but where, where some city is. And gee, the first time they, they reference that town, I'd like to know it's what country it's in. Well, and, 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 and so you hit on another one, and I guess talk a little bit about some editing issues at this point, too. And again, any journal, there, there are a lot of things style-wise that are neither right nor wrong. But what you need to do if you're an editor of a journal is pick one and stick with it. So, for, for example, city and state things, if somebody does that, again, always in the first reference, you've you got to tell them where it is. But how about state abbreviations? How many journals do you pick up and in one article you've got postal abbreviations and the next article you've got FLA uh, for Florida and, and, and so on? Neither one's necessarily right or wrong. My own preference in that, my, my normal Bible in, in growing up in, in the news industry is the AP style book. Uh, it's very different from the Chicago book of style, which is used for, for mostly for papers and, and, and books and things like this, and other, you know, and any others. But it's, it's, it was intended specifically for 
quicker, wider reading, and for ease on the eyes. So my own preference, when it does follow the AP style book, is if I'm doing state abbreviations, I'm going to do NEB, not FLUB. Because the postal abbreviation is both in caps and, and right there. A lot of people don't know that the postal abbreviations begin with. The things all in caps are very jarring to the eye. The same thing if, if somebody's speaking about stamp shows, Nordia or, or West Pax or, or you know, small town Pax or whatever, all in caps. No, it's, it's very jarring to the eye. So I'll you know, still use those, but I, I lowercase the spelling on it. And you have to do that consistently so that when a person, again, if, if you're going through a state abbreviation, for example, one article is using the, the AP style, one is using the postal style, there's a lot of noise that forms in the head. It's, it's, even, it's not, uh, it's subconscious, but it, it makes for a noisy, a noisy reading, if that's possible. Um, same thing with, uh, with, the, with dates. Uh, again, a lot of people, for whatever reason, it seems to be a trend more and more people are going towards the military style. But if you're reading an article and it's, and it's conversationally written, and you suddenly get to 1907, it's very jarring. So on September or Sept in 19th, 1943, it makes it for a much easier reading than the military. 19th Sept. Uh, it, it, it's again, it's just one of those things that creates more noise. The catalog numbers the same way for the systems. Absolutely, hence telephone catalog. You know, so you can say Scott 314 to begin with, and after that you can refer to the numbers, but you gotta let people know what it is you're referring to. This is not a criticism of Lynn's because I love having every week right on time and being very interesting. But I look back to the days that we had the other uh, weekly newspaper, it used to be the Western Stamp Collector. And the the Western Stamp Collector. Uh, going back to the But I enjoyed from time to time that they had uh, fairly long articles on postal history that I ended up you know, clipping out of my clipping file. And, you know, such things are not done in lens. So, uh, I was saying maybe we could start to mix in maybe in the future or articles like that are interesting. Well, it, it would be nice, and of course, you know, that, that, that would be up to the editors of lens, but one of the things I know they're fighting with is the magazine, because the physical size of the magazine and the page count has shrunk over the years, there's not a lot of room for longer features anymore. So that's, that's one of the things they struggle with. And as a commercial publication, whether you know this or not, um, you've got to, you can't really, you've got to have, uh, you've got to maintain and, and editorial ratios, and some of those are pretty strict as well. And so you really, plus every time you add a signature to your printing, uh, you're adding significant expense too. So I, I know they like to do some long features, but I think they're constrained by their, by their budget, by their, their uh, ad ratio. Which is where the journals come in, you know, especially journals. If you don't subscribe to a lot of specialty journals, you're missing something. Uh, the, the, the specialty societies in, in our hobby produce some of the, really some of the finest uh, material that's written, and you're able to immerse yourself much more deeply into those things that you really care about. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for letting me.